I'm Stephen Foskett, organizer of Tech Field Day, publisher of Gestalt IT, and we're here at Cloud Field Day 15 in Silicon Valley with a great group of folks who are experts on enterprise, cloud, Kubernetes, that sort of thing. And the question that we have is, uh, given that Kubernetes has become, has crossed the chasm, and has become a language uh, and concept and framework on, uh, around which we understand the cloud today, is this the end of the discussion? Are we done? Uh, have we solved cloud? Or alternatively, what comes next? And uh, I'm going to put that to the to the group here. Rather than argue about sort of which version or distribution or flavor of Kubernetes uh, takes off, no, we're pretty we're pretty confident it's going to be containers. It's going to be orchestrated. It's going to be called Kubernetes. What comes after this? What's the next big thing? What's the next trend? And, and where are we going next? So uh, Nathan, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, so we're already seeing a lot of different things in terms of the abstraction of Kubernetes, right? There are different solutions, going back to something that Gina had brought up in a, in a previous discussion around whoever figures out the best way to run containers is going to win this battle. Um, I, we saw in open source, Kubernetes probably won that battle across you know, different areas, but now we're seeing what comes after Kubernetes is like this abstraction. And I think it's interesting because it's when it's difficult, Kubernetes has to be easy and it has to be boring for it to be adopted and it has to be supported. Um, moving into this new notion of an abstracted Kubernetes cluster, uh, the ability for, I'll use App Engine as an example, and Google, the ability for a developer to containerize his application within a Docker file, upload that into an engine, and then it just runs it with all, all of the orchestration that Kubernetes actually has, but then solutions on top of it to do things like canary deployments, blue-green deployments, and things that you want to see, that's really powerful. And that could be the next step of Kubernetes. When we move into the probably another area, uh, which is you know functions of, as a service or serverless solutions, these are also a different area where Kubernetes still exists, as a platform for those serverless solutions or functions as a service. Um, I do not like serverless because it's still running on infrastructure, but at the same time, these are the different areas where this uh, technology is still being used in the background, abstracted away from people that are being able to see these solutions, but could be the next thing. Yeah, I mean, for me, the what comes next is the further iterate, uh, maturity of like Kubernetes and that orchestration capability. The the reality is we look start to look down level beyond the major enterprises and you know or, or startups that are developer heavy that are using it. You know to the point we started with today uh, or that I started with today that SMB the adoption is going to be the long tail. Is we need to see that maturization of the tooling that you use to consume it. VSphere worked because I could right click, clicky, clicky my way through it and deploy virtual machines. You starting to see a lot of tooling that's starting to come out, things like Stormforce we've heard from today that kind of made that life cycle of optimization possible. We're like talking about rocking tomorrow, which is gonna let those kind of things, you know, the pointy clicky kind of happen. And, and I think as we see those things be more mature, we'll see that, you know, you know, the, the hockey stick will really start to kind of take off maybe a little bit. I think you guys are missing the point. I mean, Kubernetes is great. Yeah, the ecosystem is going to mature. It's going to be easier, et cetera, et cetera. The question is, what's your developer going to do next if he's going to be developing an application for tomorrow? It's, it's got to be ML. It's got to be AI. It's, it's, it's where the world is moving. I mean, if I'm going to develop a new application for the enterprise or, or some other solution to, to deploy into retail, whatever, I've, I'm going to start with an AI or an ML solution, model training and all that other stuff. And it's going to be the, it's going to be the core of the application. Well, I think you hit the right point too. And obviously Calvin, will, we're going to hand it right to you as the more developer experienced of, of the bunch of us that, and to carry on what you talked about, Nathan, the abstraction is going to move up. Like we're going to move towards serverless that will like in the machine learning world, these are not going to be living in VMs and containers. Like this abstraction, we're just going to move the abstractions further up. Underneath it, agreed, it all runs on a container, which runs on a piece of hardware, which runs on a 
physical network. Yeah. I mean, look, even ECS, we used to always joke about that. People are like, oh, I'm running in containers, but you're running on EC2 instances. It deploys on EC. So there's always a thing underneath it. But, you know, in the end, like Ray says, what's actually going to matter? I want to push code. I want to do a thing. What, what it sits on won't necessarily matter. Now, service, I, I, I with you, Nathan, also, service is a higher fire because it, it, there's the management of it is brutal, you know, but different beast, different conversation. We need another hour for that one. But, no, but take that like up to the next level. I, I agree. But I think there's a next step we, we all missed there is if the, if the technology can enable me to take advantage of all the hardware that's even sitting in my own laptop, but I don't have to think about how to do that, if it can detect or infer that all of a sudden my code has gone down code paths that actually would be optimized if it was using the, the neural engine or a specific efficiency core to save energy. And I don't think about that kind of tuning. And, that, and that's the probably the, where I see maybe the next level of Kubernetes is actually going, is it's going to make some decisions for the developers, make some decisions for the ops team, because they've got better jobs to do than you know, analyze the code and figure out, oh, this actually, they're running you know, PyTorch at this point. It's better run on a specific kind of core. I know now you can you can say I, I require a GPU, but it's pretty primitive right now at, at this point in time. And I think that's gonna we're gonna see a lot of opinionated stacks released that cater to this. Yeah, and if you think I love the way you just said that because if you think of all of the hardware innovations that you can program your chips now to do specific mm -hmm. things for you wherever you want them to be, and, you, and with containers, and you were kind of talking about that before too. You can make things really tiny. If I can put a, what I need to run an application, even with ML, um, AI, uh, 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 yeah, part of the AI perspective, and I can gather information truly on an edge device, whether mm -hmm. it's a speaker or a camera, or it's on a boat, or it's on a satellite, or like whatever, but I'm able to real time that information. And it sounds fun and awesome for lots of entertainment things, but there's real time things. If doctors can remotely do surgery or like that all is going to depend on how we set applications up for them to take advantage, to use it. And I think that if we can automate the boring stuff, the boring ops stuff, the boring dev stuff that frees all of our great minds up to start figuring out how we create those kinds of infrastructures to really take advantage of the, the, um, the, the new thing, and think about quantum, that's coming. Who knows what that's going to do? So we've got a lot of work to do in front of us. Well, I think, and I, th this is, I think the, 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 the signature that's maybe missing right now, and, and I think you're totally right about this, um, that if we look at where computing is going, it's going to heterogeneous and disaggregated compute. And um, there are so many technologies starting inside the CPU itself. I mean, modern operating systems, are doing this, you know, you look at the, uh, the iPhone and it's got at least five different kinds of CPUs that I can think of within the modern, the A16, right? There's at least five different CPUs in there or PUs, I guess, XPUs in there. Um, and they each run a different kind of code in a different situation in order to optimize for a different thing, whether it's performance or power efficiency or whatever. And in the data center, we have that as well. So, I mean, if you look at where Intel and NVIDIA especially are going, it's toward heterogeneous compute, where you have a CPU that has um, certain accelerators on board and certain accelerators off board, and maybe different types of CPU cores within the same chip sometimes. If, and, and then you have uh, GPU accelerators, you've got uh, AI and M or ML inferencing uh, engines, you've got uh, DPUs, and if you look at how DPUs are used, it's the same thing. There, um, you, you have containerization of, um, of components, application components, and that can be then distributed to DPU cores, either um, within the server or even in different servers across the network. Then we kind of take another step back and we look where CXL is going. And where CXL is going is into an extreme heterogeneous compute where you would have uh, disaggregated CPUs different types of memory, different me profiles for, pro for, for memory access, different profiles for accelerator access, for IO, for storage, all of those things. And all of that is going to inevitably lead to an incredibly complex compute environment. And that incredibly complex compute environment needs an orchestrator to decide where to run workloads. And to Calvin's point, I think what we're gonna see next 
is application development, uh, focusing on basically uh, containerizing, for lack of a better word, containerizing workloads with distinct um, environment requirements. And that uh, the next Kubernetes jump, I mean, Kubernetes can do this, and I think it will do this, is to distribute those workloads intelligently in the, the right place. So if it's, you know, so, so instead of having an application running in a virtual machine or even an application running in a container, you're going to have a microservice that needs TensorFlow cores running in a container. And then that TensorFlow application container is going to get shipped off to something that has Tensor acceleration. And then you're going to have that come back. And then you're going to have the PyTorch one that's, that's, that's going. You're going to have the, um, you know, 512, you know, AVX 512 one, you're going to have the one that could run on cheap ARM cores that use low power. And all of these things are going to be orchestrated by that orchestration engine. But my knowledge of developers is that they can't really grow. You, you can't have, you can't leave that in the hands of the developers to decide where to distribute that stuff, right? They just want to freaking write it and run it. And so to me, that's where the next generation goes. That's where the, that's where Kubernetes goes next is to intelligently allocate workloads across a massive and disaggregated compute environment. Did I just win y'all or no? To, oh, Nathan, to that go. point, I just want to add something because I think you're right. And I wanted, wanted to add a, a core function that exists within Kubernetes, has so many other use cases, which is the ability of control loops, right? Understanding what should be there and maintaining what is there. If something comes up and it says it's bad, it's going to redeploy it, right? That functionality is amazing. And there's already infrastructure as code services coming out of um, the Kubernetes work uh, lifecycle that says, okay, I can deploy AWS resources based off of a Kubernetes manifest. And what I do is I give it resource manifest and then push it through this uh, Kubernetes you know, resource operator. And then it goes and it deploys everything that I want to in AWS. You can come to me and say, well, why would I do that? Why, why would I? Why wouldn't I do that with like Terraform? Well, very obviously, because if you did it in Terraform, then the drift detection isn't quite there. It it's, can find some things, but it's definitely not going to redeploy something when it breaks. If the ability for control loops to be able to find those things and then redeploy it, that, that's beautiful as an operator. I love that. But the other thing around it is the idea of um, multi-cloud, right? When we talk about, you know, that type of self-healing that does exist within the same cloud platform. So like uh, cloud formations within AWS has that capability, right? But when we move into, well, I want to deploy some things in AWS and some things into Azure, polycloud, multi-cloud, whatever the heck you want to call it, I don't care. But if you have the ability to control loop both of those locations at the same time, again, it's a win. And so to your point, the ability to take these orchestration, this orchestration platform and apply it across multiple different areas, I, I really can see where that can really start building those type of solutions. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I was checking the last release of Kubernetes, official release of Kubernetes. It seems that they are grabbing a lot of features on Kubernetes itself. And um, let me say, it's not like a black hole that is attracting everything, but uh, this is the natural evolution of Kubernetes depending on, uh, yeah, what, not only developers, but all the people that are uh, running Kubernetes once. And um, yeah, we, I'm MC, yeah, I agree with uh, Stephen about this aggregation and something that they, they are, yeah, working uh, in order to guarantee or better automatically deliver something on the right CPU to have them the maximum efficiency. But there are also something like security improvements. There are way to deliver like you know uh, how many of you have uh, used uh, GitOps, for example to deliver uh, the, uh, this application on kubernetes and then there are oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, there are some other features that uh, yeah today we are delivering as separated components tomorrow the kubernetes itself and this is i think the trend like, uh, you know, uh, deliver a CRD, CRD can do all the stuff. Yesterday, you have deliver a component here, then an integration on cloud stuff and whatever, for example. So uh, I think that um, this is the natural evolution. So um, 
today is a smaller part kubernetes yes tomorrow will be a big part i agree my opinion. i like where you're going in that and it sort of brings up the other thing of like as a kubernetes as its core staying is simply a way to schedule resources across available abstractions to compute right compute ultimately yeah. and it will become gpu dpu tpu xpu whatever it will be is that and that i think will begin to find its way into the core but what i adore about how kubernetes has done well so far again learning on the backs of the pains of openstack so we started to shove too many things vendors started to add their customized bits but if kubernetes stays as a true simplified api for compute and resources then what happens is then it can become the underlay to all of these things so that we can have fast on cube we can have paths on cube. we can have whatever it's going to be on cube and it becomes a thing because then we can build opinionated solutions based on a common core model and keep that purity in the model and not try and i, I don't want nsx showing up in the core of kubernetes not because it's nsx it's just like it will then make the person that's not using nsx have to think about nsx when they want to upstream something into kubernetes so that that purity of the model i think is pretty cool we're getting there you know like it's it will become was the old halton catch fire thing this is it's not the thing it's the thing that will it let you do the thing so though given that though does Kubernetes need, as Chris Evans points out here, does Kubernetes need to have storage and networking services as well? Because, you know, the, the pillars of, of, of tech, you know, you, you, have, you have compute, which of course is important, but you also have storage and networking. Those are important as well, or IO. Uh, I mean, you can call, you can rephrase those things a little bit, but uh, is Kubernetes missing out by not having more support for things that aren't compute? I'll say, I don't mean to jump in right. The problem with making storage core to being scheduled within Kubernetes is that it requires you to not abstract behind that layer. That's why the CSI model is fantastic and the CNI model is fantastic. Because so as a CNI, I'm representing my network using a common abstraction to the CNI. So it doesn't matter that it's SDN, SD-WAN, SD, whatever. And same thing, if I'm running disaggregated storage infrastructure or hyper-converged storage infrastructure, or I'm running this monolithic tower full of servers. It, the CSI and the CNI present the right way to consume. I mean, they are scheduling, but it's like limited amount of scheduling. And then it offloads the true scheduling to the backend controller, which is now able to use those things. That's why I like that, because storage is far too complex and too diverse in order to have that be scheduled purely in the core. So I think it was really interesting um, listening to NetApp and what they have. And I, I know that other companies like Pure Reef or Pure talk about this as well, offering up their APIs and being able to um, spin things up and down from their APIs. So I think we have to move beyond just thinking about Kubernetes and, and break it back down into what it is, which is containers. And if, if you're calling the support from the containers, because a container is, it, it is what it is, and it's not gonna get any bigger, any smaller in what it does without adding a lot of things to create something new to it, right? And the beauty of the container being a, a part, you know, being an abstraction of the file system is that it is very, very portable, and it's portable to go onto any type of system. And, and you're able to break an application into its piece parts. So if I have an application and I need to have storage with that application, why can't I have a pipeline for my application, which all the stuff in the pipeline says, I need to pull in this, I need to pull in this. Oh my God, it's expanded. Let me add more compute, whatever container pieces that, that I have constructed for that. Let me pull in my NetApp array. Let me do this. Let me go build this and build it out and build it out. Shrink it, grow it as it needs to be from a pipeline situation and be able to go get, if we're able to get that information from the, the vendors that su supply this, either from a cloud perspective or from a on-premises perspective, then we can build applications and we can put them together and we construct the underlying way they need to li live on them as the application's being created and as it's being in real life 
tested in production. So it turns into this thing where all of a sudden we're part of the continuous integration, continuous development process that's really the application process. We're actually friends with our developers. We go back and forth and we talk about what we need and we can see all of this in real time, maybe monitor it with, with other things that we've seen that monitor the whole thing. So I think that's one of the, the, the dangers of thinking of Kubernetes of being the end-all be-all of this when it's really a container thing. Is Kubernetes the best way to deploy and control that in your environment? Yeah, but this is only a part of it. What happens to the rest of it? If I have to bring up bare metal from the ground, and I believe everything should be infrastructure as code. If I have to bring up this bare metal as code, how do I do that? And how do I put that in a pipeline where it goes to Kubernetes and it goes to anything else? So I think that's where we're headed. That's, that's, I think that's real smart. And I, and I, I agree with you that, that it's not just about this, it's, you know, and, and, and that we do need, as Nathan points out, to look at things from the operations or from the developer side and ask them, you know, how can we better serve you? And I think that that's, to me, the key uh, to this changing mindset on the operations side of the table is, is instead of just sort of throwing things over the wall and saying, here you go, that's your environment, saying, wait, you know, how can we support you better? And to me, I, I think that that was really, you know, as we were saying before, uh, the better, uh, you know, one of the one of the better outcomes of implementing Kubernetes is that we started having everybody sit at the table together. I mean, you you agree with this? Have thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I mean, from the developer experience, uh, it's hard to say because there's so many. Again, there's a range of people we call developers mm -hmm. across the board, and not all of them are going to fully take advantage of these these tools. But man, when they start getting a taste for it. And they start integrating it into their workflow and they start integrating it into their IDE where it it's like second nature. The, the system, the whole piece, all the pieces come together on your local workstation as you're developing and you're not going off to like five different dashboards and five different apps trying to figure out, oh, tune the database or to, to spin up the Redis. And when it brings all these pieces together, I, I think you're going to see the IDE market has already started adopting this. I mean, you, you go to VS Code or, or PyCharm and there's, fully baked in support for uh, Docker and containers or Kubernetes, or you start looking at things like um, like the Kate's uh, lens, you know, utilities. Some of those tools are really powerful and basically put a lot of power in the hands of developers who aren't sysadmins, operations people. They don't have the background that a lot of, all of you have. And when it comes to scaling applications or even caring about the infrastructure running in the, underneath the covers, but it gives them that visibility where they can start making decisions about their own application and how they develop that application and where it needs to be deployed and what's needed in it. I think Kubernetes is, is, is lacks, lacking the understanding of storage and lacking the understanding of networking at, at a base level is not good. I mean, the, the problem is you're getting more disaggregated compute. So you need to understand where the compute lies, what kind of compute it is. And the, the scheduling, necessary to determine where a container is going to run has to take advantage of the idea of where the where what kind of compute it needs what kind of where the compute is what kind of storage does it need where that storage happens to be connected to and do you know for the networking so i mean it, it, I, I like the idea of csi and cni and stuff like that but yeah it's it it's it's one step too far you're very you're yeah that's it's a really good point ray and i think this is why i mean we saw the resource management platforms that leverage it, it has to be able to tie in. Yeah, because if it's just abstracted away and it can't understand it, we're we're misusing and, so much infrastructure. And, 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 and to your point, Ray, I think that, that of the people at this table who know that storage can be hard, uh, I'm certainly second to Ray. Um, storage is surprisingly hard. And I, I see this sometimes with container solutions, especially where they sort of hand wave and say, and then the storage happens, right? <laughs> it's okay. You know, and CSI in a way is conceptually that saying, you know what, eh, storage isn't that hard. We'll just say we need some storage that does this. Now go do it. You know, and and that's not real. That's not true. That's no more true than saying that the uh, the rest of the compute environment works that way, right? I mean, it seems a little hand wavy. And the same on the networking side, right? Oh well, then I need to be able to communicate with this other container, so make it happen. It, that's great. But do we need to figure out how to make that happen? I, I want to say, Ray, I agree with you about the storage. Uh, so it's a lack, right? Uh, because you must know where, yeah, because storage, uh, yeah, it's important to know where workload must, uh, should run, should be placed. 
better. I want to say uh, something about the network. What, what is the evolution of the network in Kubernetes space? Is that the network itself or is it an abstraction of the network? Um, I can put here some yeah, real cases of um, people that want, uh, for example, deliver an application using um, yeah, the load balancer itself that is available as entry point of a Kubernetes cluster or service mesh with canary release. There are different ways to do that. But uh, behind, the, uh, behind uh, the chains, there is uh, uh, something that is uh, abstracting the network. So I want to say service A must communicate with service B. That's enough. Mm -hmm. I don't care about security or whatever. This is embedded on the service itself. And uh, yeah, when you start, for example, delivering a new application, do, mm, I want to guarantee that the service is never interrupted during the release because I don't know how many releases you are doing in a, in a week. Probably a lot, right? Yeah. So there is a, a rollout time. It is really tight, right? And for this reason, I want to say that, yeah, networking, CNI, yeah, is good, must improve. Uh, I agree. But the future from Kubernetes point of view is not a network, but is the abstraction of this network. This is my point of view based on experience that I have every day. We fought this in the OpenStack community around what we put in, in Cinder for representing block storage. And it became this problem where we weren't sure should it be a plugin or should it be into the core of Cinder? And that's actually kind of what broke it was exactly what you said, right? Like we had some of these, these capabilities that were just being ignored by the driver. And, and they said, well, then create a custom driver. But even there, it, was, it wasn't really using it to its full capability. And we were losing stuff. And, and OpenStack basically ate its own neck by then anyway. So yeah. it had moved away from being enterprise storage friendly. It was much more important on the telco and the broad network capabilities. But this, it is a great point that we're abstracting away so much, but there's so many capabilities that are going to be lost because we've chosen that model for extraction. And then the purist in me says, it's the right way to do it because it keeps it out of the core. Yeah, it's, it's a tough decision. I, I think at, at around this table, I think around this table, there's so many great use cases for what comes next, going from AI and ML. I think that's, that's something that we're already seeing because we see solutions like NVIDIA Grid allowing GPUs to go into Kubernetes clusters, which can be used to train models for artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's an actual use case for Kubernetes. And that's definitely something that, you know, is going to be the next thing. Full stop. I mean, like we, we hear, it, it's a joke now just how much we hear AI and ML brought up to us so much. But uh, the other thing that I think is good to point out is that developer experience and the IDE becoming a, a much more core-centric focus. At VMware Explorer, they showed how TAP can create this platform. I think they called it platforming. And I could be saying that wrong. Get Colbert, I apologize. But there's a way to actually integrate your VS code directly into a pipeline so that when you actually type on VS code, it does a pulling to actually pull your code and immediately send it up and immediately go through a pipeline and immediately go into production. Now, you probably don't want to do that, right? You probably don't want to immediately say that, that you want to do that for something like production, but for something like test, I think that would be pretty awesome because at the end of the day, I am no longer developing just on my laptop. What I am actually putting on my laptop is immediately going into the, or the infrastructure, the orchestration, and now being available so that I can actually see, like I have two screens up here. Imagine if one was the actual website in the, in the test area, and this is my VS code. Whatever I type here shows up here. That is probably the next iteration of like a developer experience. Because so we have a lot of that today. I mean, with tools like Scaffold, yeah. And be able to run our C, like CI locally with the uh, like pre-commit actions as a developer. I can technically do a lot of those things. Like the features now. Teleport. Mm -hmm. Which tool? A scaffold. Scaffold. A tool oh, like yeah. Scaffold. scaffold. So, yeah. so it, 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 it's actually like way more efficient about synchronizing my changes and doing a bind amount. Like those things need to go away because it's just way too too heavy. Like I think a, re a lot of the reason that developers haven't adopted containers to date at the same accelerated rate that they were adopted in the data center is because of the resource 
abuse that Docker put on Macs. Uh, if you were in a Windows world, it worked better because you got WSL2, and so it, there was a lot less overhead. The people who are on Linux, you know, running an Ubuntu like desktop, it was beautiful. I, 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 for the last three and a half years, that's why I've been running, and it was, I, I was having all the great, wonderful experiences, and all my Mac developers were like, this sucks. It is a resource hog. My IO is going through the roof. My CPU is going through the roof. They wanted to throw it out uh, until recently, where some of these problems now get solved with some of this other tooling, where my machine now is liberated again to actually be productive. Well, one, one sort of a, an, an, an aside from all this is we're talking about the developer experience in deploying on this infrastructure. We're talking about the operator experience for running this infrastructure. The operator experience continues in areas where even the developer won't care especially Pumla, knowing that you run a significantly sized enterprise environment, what percentage of your applications are packaged apps? Like, I know we all love to think that everything's going to be SaaS, but I came out of an environment where I had terabytes upon terabytes of file serving data, monstrous SharePoint farms, all these things that it goes like I was not able to move it to the cloud. And so I had 60% of my environment that ran on, in that case, it was VMware at the time, was never no code was ever touched by a human in the walls or the network of my environment. So there's a, there's this, a big chunk of apps that are just gonna live in this infrastructure that you know, they will be developers that run on Kubernetes or containers or whatever. But it's an interesting thing that we, we focus on this pure use case, but we have so many apps that are just like eating up 60% of our data center and our storage that are yeah. just things you have. And are those even apps? I mean, that's the thing, right. I mean, SharePoint is, it's sort of a, a, a weird zombie. Um, yeah, it, it's a, it's a, that's why I say it's an aside because I, magic. yeah, it's a funny thing that I don't know what the right, I don't know that even there is a question in it, but it's, yeah. we kind of slip by this because we go right to the like the developers running on Kubernetes. I just, I just really want to touch on that really quickly because that, that is legitimately probably the, the immediate future that we're probably seeing within Kubernetes and especially around containers because we're already seeing enterprise appliances being deployed a single node Kubernetes cluster and the services for that appliance are actually running within that cluster. So if you don't understand how Kubernetes works, you legitimately cannot get into that appliance and configure it and tr troubleshoot it. You have to know what you're actually doing. Now, I'm sure you can follow a runbook and do uh, certain things, but I see that as another adoption policy for Kubernetes because now we're seeing actual, you know, VMware does this, right? And so we're seeing solutions out there that are already built for Kubernetes, running on Kubernetes in your environment. You just may not know it. Yeah, actually, yeah. I mean, to say, to give an example, uh, you know, you want to mention the name, but it rhymes with Merbonomic, and it <laughs> would deliver an OVA that runs a self-encapsulated, resilient Kubernetes environment inside the OVA, because that was the, and because in the end, we could then use the same model to deploy on EKS, AKS, whatever, but it was, that became the way that we would deploy it. So you actually became a cube admin if you had to troubleshoot something because you're like, all right, I need you to use kubectl. That's right. I said kubectl. There you go. Cube cuddles. Hey. <laughs> so, so to wrap up then, so I think that what, what comes next, um, I, I heard a lot of different things here. Um, but I think that overall, it sounds like what we're looking for is Kubernetes to extend, to be a better companion for developers, to give developers a more friendly environment, to embrace uh, changes in technology, while not losing so much, uh, losing track of its sort of slim uh, simplicity. It's, it's crazy to say so that's crazy. And Kubernetes <laughs> in the same sentence, but um, to not get so off track that it becomes a another uh, open stack and tries to boil the entire data center 